I should point out, obviously, I am a, an American. I, I am not steeped in Japanese culture the way a Japanese person is, so I am doing my best to kind of interpret things as best I can from the sources I've, I've gotten. So kind of disclaimer that uh, I'm not the world's foremost expert in Japanese culture but I've uh, learned as much as possible. This will, by nature, because it's discussing a lot of different topics, it will kind of bounce around to different elements of uh, anime versus of, um, Japanese culture and how that is expressed uh, in anime, as well as Western culture and so forth and so on. There's just no very one clear through line through all of these topics, unfortunately. And obviously, you know, our brains are excellent at pattern matching, so as soon as I mention one pattern, you'll say, well, there's an exception. Yes, there's an exception to everything we're gonna list here. That is kind of the nature of reality. Um, there are kind of two mistakes people make when they try to do these sorts of uh, sort of culture comparisons. Uh, one is to assume that everyone's the same the world round, and thus culture doesn't matter. And it has no real impact on us. People are people, and whatever culture you're in just, you know, kind of bounces off you. And that's obviously not really accurate. The culture you grow up in does impact you, does influence you. It doesn't completely define who you are, but it does you know, move you on your course through life. And that's one of the things we want to kind of uh, explore here. The other mistake is to go kind of the, the opposite direction and to say, well, because other cultures are different, they are fundamentally unknowable. And we can't understand another culture, so why even try? And this is where a lot of the wacky Japan stuff comes from. This idea that, oh, Japan, you're just so silly. And it's kind of dismissive. And this is obviously incorrect as well. We can understand more about other cultures. We're never going to understand everything there is to know, but we can learn more. We can get better at all this stuff. And that's kind of the spirit within which this, is, um, uh, this panel is being presented. And as well, um, kind of related to that, you know, one can get a little, we're geeks, we tend to like to get really deep into things and be very definitive about stuff and be very clear. And you know, the reality is a lot of these things are just tropes, you really just relax, it's not that big of a deal. You know, we're, we're trying to understand things about culture, we're not necessarily gonna know everything about a culture and make a definitive statement about how things really, really are. So that's just kind of reality. Um, all right, so you are a hero heading out on your journey or a heroine heading out on your story uh, in Japan or over here in the West. How might those be different? What does that look like as you're heading out on your journey? Um, over here, our protagonists tend to be superheroes or at the very least exceptional people. Go back to Gilgamesh, Beowulf, Hercules. These are not normal men. They are not quite supermen, all of them, but they are certainly very exceptional people, right? And that was very much the, the standard in uh, Greek mythology and and um, even Egyptian mythology and so forth going on. And we see that even today. You know, James Bond is not simply a, a secret agent. He is a ladies' man and an excellent gambler and a great shot and all these various things all thrown together. Harry Potter is not just the chosen one. He is also a great leader and he solves mysteries and he knows parcel tongue and he has danger sets. And, you know, all of these things are all piled onto Harry Potter to make him extra, extra, extra special. Um, again, not a bad thing, it's just kind of the way we tend to create our heroes. We like heroes we can look up to. Superman does not just fly, right? He has laser vision and all these other different things. Heat vision, uh, so on and so on. Over in Japan, the heroes tend to be closer to normal people. There is much less of a sense of, our, of the hero being truly um, amazingly exceptional. You know, the, the first episode of Pokemon does not begin with Ash being told that he has to go out and collect all the Pokemon to defeat an evil wizard and save the world, right? Ash is just some kid who goes out and collects Pokemon and has his adventure. There are lots of other kids like him. He is not special, except that apparently his Pokemon can bring back from the dead. But that's a whole other thing from one of the movies. It's just weird about Pokemon. Um, Spike Spiegel from Cowboy Bebop is a... He's an excellent martial artist. He's not a good bounty hunter. <laughs> no. uh, um, he's not very good at romance. Um, you know, again, think about kind of the, the Western detective trope. And he doesn't really fit any of the standards we have for that. 
you know, even he's wanted by the triads, but they don't really try very hard. You know, it's not like he's, you know, he's not like he's going everywhere trying to hide from the triads. So, eh, whatever. Um, so they're much closer to a relatable, normal person. Um, now, you will obviously have heroes in anime and manga and such that do have a power, um, but they tend to have a power, right? They tend to be unusual in that they have a power, but not exceptional in that they have a power. And when they have a power, it usually comes with a serious drawback. So um, in this case, uh, our hero ha um, is sort of blessed with these demonic powers, but he's also kind of a jerk, and he keeps pushing people away, and he's this intense loner. And so a lot of the story is about how he is overcoming his drawbacks to become a, um, a more useful, functional, essentially, person in his life. This is a blue exorcist, I believe. Uh, so you have that kind of interesting, different dynamic going along. Um, th and then think about Jojo and girls shows. Not only is the um, uh, protagonist not special, she's often unpopular and very plain, so to speak. Imagine trying to pitch your average you know, girl's romance show to an executive in Hollywood and saying, okay, so we're gonna have this girl and she starts dating a boy in her class and the show is about them dating. Okay. And then they fight vampires in the evening, right? No, 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 they just go and they date, right? But they're a member of a band or something, right? No, 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 they just hang out. She doesn't really have any other friends. You know, it's just about them dating. <laughs> now, we can't tell those stories in a media over here, apparently, uh, or very, very rarely. Uh, but it happens over there all the time because they understand that the protagonist, again, does not need to be special. The protagonist just needs to be somebody that we care about. And we can weave that into the story in various ways. The thing about, uh, so you're heading out on your journey, you have your, um, um, your mission that you're going to um, accept out on your, your big heroic quest. And typically you are the chosen one. And this is a, a, a thing very common uh, all around the world. But it comes quite differently in different cultures. Over here, generally being chosen gives you power and advantage. You know, the Green Lantern ring doesn't really have any inherent drawbacks. Um, there can be drawbacks in being the Green Lantern, but inherently that doesn't really give you any problems. You know, having Excalibur is a good thing, right? It doesn't suck out your life blood whenever you use it. It is a, a good, you know, fundamentally. And that seems to be a, a very common trope over here. Over in the East, being chosen tends to make you a target, and cause you trouble. And yes, I chose the saddest possible image of Madoka Magic I could possibly find. Um, you know, think about magical girl shows. Think about how often in a magical girl show, the characters, there's something going on in the real world, and they also have to fight, you know, the bad guys, and it's a struggle back and forth between, you know, choosing between their friends and saving the world, so to speak. It happens all the time in those series because this is a fundamental concept of being a hero. There's a saying in Japan, um, the nail that sticks up will be hammered back down. Right? The idea that if you are exceptional, that means you attract more attention. And people are going to, you know, make you, are going to, going to encourage you to conform more and more and more. Uh, which comes out in interesting ways in some of these stories. Think about Batman. How often is being Batman a problem for Bruce Wayne? Or vice versa in the stories, right? It just doesn't, I mean, it happens very, very, very rarely. Um, Naruto Uzumaki is constantly bullied as a child. Constantly bullied because of who he is. Fundamentally. What he was born with causes him tremendous pain throughout his life specifically because he was chosen. It's a very different take on the concept. Um, Sailor Moon being another great example. And Sailor Moon actually was really playing around with this concept in terms of um, making the show more uh, violent, for lack of a better term, where Magical Girl series before Sailor Moon tended to be more about girls solving social problems, um, 
helping out their friends through their magical powers, whereas in Sailor Moon, it's much more you know, fighting uh, villainous evil powers. Uh, and this is a, a constant struggle they have, is in how to juggle that while also trying to be normal people. And it's, again, something where that struggle is generally not present in our, uh, in our stories. Even the X-Men, which people often bring up as an example of the kind of heroes that are more in the Asian mold, you know, Scott Summers doesn't really struggle with being um, Colossus, gosh. Cyclops. Cyclops, thank you. Duh. Um, you know, uh, they have kind of integrated those things. Now, they struggle with who they are. And certainly, that is an example of where in the West we have a, a story of who you are uh, and being a chosen one is not always a great thing. Um, so, all right, so you're heading out on your, on your, your journey. And every story about myth is required by law to mention um, uh, Joseph Campbell who uh, wrote a lot about myth and what myth was. And he read a lot of uh, mythology and tried to come up with systems to explain mythology. And one of his big innovations was what he, was what he called the monomyth. And, the, and this is a concept that is kind of misunderstood, uh, partly because the monomyth, I think, is a, is a poor choice of word for what he came up with. If you actually read uh, what he wrote, uh, the idea of the monomyth was to identify common tropes in uh, big heroic myths and kind of list them. He was not saying every heroic myth has all of these elements. He was saying these crop up a lot in a lot of things, and let's just note that and kind of move on. So these are things that happen in a lot of, of heroic stories, according to Joseph Campbell. Uh, a perfect example of this is Star Wars Episode IV. Um, so you think, you know, call to adventure, R2 lands on the planet, and it confines him, refusal of the call, you know, oh, I can't go, my uncle will kill me, uh, crossing the threshold, door to trials, so forth and so on. Um, you know, magic flight is um, Han Solo coming in, um, I'm sorry, uh, uh, Rescue from Without is Han Solo coming in at the end. Uh, there's actually a, a shot in Star Wars that very few people actually talk about that is, I believe, George Lucas explicitly following the monomyth. Uh, after Luke and Obi-Wan have met Han Solo for the first time, and, and they sort of go off, there's a shot of them walking along um, in Mos Eisley, having this short conversation where, um, where Obi-Wan says, you'll have to sell your speeder, your land speeder, and Luke says, that's all right, I don't need it anymore. I'm never coming back to this planet again. That is crossing the threshold. That is Luke saying, I am out of here, and I am, I am leaving behind everything. And that was, I think, George Lucas explicitly putting that in there to tell everyone that our hero is now moving on. Um, it's, a, it's a small thing, but it, it's important for kind of establishing these elements of the, the hero's journey and how they're going on. However, Joseph Campbell did not read a lot of Asian myths. He read some but he didn't really delve too much into how Asian myths uh, moved on and, and explored their topics. And they tend to be a little bit different. Come on in, plenty of time, we have plenty of space. And so, um, there's a, so there are Asian myths which do follow this pattern, but it is more common uh, to see some other patterns. And one of the biggest patterns is the one thing that I hope all of you remember out of this panel, if there's one thing, WAP. Wa is a Japanese word which refers to essentially the, the effective functioning of a group of people. So you think of a group of folks at work, where you all get together, you all get stuff done. Importantly, it does not mean a happily functional, everybody loves each other and gets along all the time group, right? It is everybody knows their role and gets their stuff done. That's what wa means. Almost every story in anime, and manga, I would argue, can be seen through the perspective of either Wa was broken, and it is a story of Wa being restored in the group, or Wa being forged by a group over the course of the story. This is just everywhere in anime and manga. Great example of the former is Kiki's delivery service. Uh, Kiki had her family, she had her life and her friends, and the, that movie begins with Kiki's wah being broken. 
All of those relationships are upended, and the entire movie is about her forging a new wall, finding a new group of people to interact with and, you know, have a relationship with. Importantly in the film, she meets Tombo early on, and she never gets, you know, a, a, an effective relationship with Tombo until the very end, and as soon as that happens, the movie's over. Right? Because her wa is established, and that's done, and we can move on. And that's why, you know, for us, that ending can feel a little abrupt, but from the Japanese perspective, okay, all the loose ends are effectively tied up. Right? Um, a great example of the other is the melancholy of Haruhi Susan Mia, which is about forming basically a, uh, uh, a club. Has anyone here seen Haruhi Susan Mia? Okay, okay, a few people, cool. Um, so, Haruhi is a very, <laughs> um, it's a very postmodern anime series. It is playing off a lot of anime tropes, but fundamentally it's about a teenage girl who decides to start a paranormal research club at her high school and uh, go and find paranormal activity. And uh, she, she, they spend all this time trying to find paranormal activity and finding none without her realizing that every other member of the, the club is secretly like an alien or a time traveler or something else, <laughs> right? Who is desperately trying to keep that secret from her. Uh, and there's a whole plot line around that and why that, that should be. But um, importantly, so they aired the episodes of this out of order, out of chronological order, uh, which is quite intentional in terms of hinting at things and you're wondering why this is so, and you see why in later episodes and so forth. Um, but the final episode chronologically is an episode called, um, I think, A Quiet Day in the Rain, which is just one day at the end of school where they're all going to the club room, hanging out, chatting. One of the guys needs to get a heater, I think, for the club room. He goes get the heater and comes back. Basically, nothing happens in the episode. It is just them talking and engaging and verifying that they all have their... Um, um, uh, verifying uh, what their relationships are with each other, basically, and that's where the story ends, because the club has been established. They haven't found what they're looking for, but all of the roles of all the people involved are established. Now, importantly, they're not all happy being in that club, right? They're not all, um, they haven't all found their ultimate place in the universe, but they found their place in this group. And that is what tends to come up over and over in these stories, is what is your place in the group? Uh, now, obviously, if you have a long-running adventure series like Pokemon, for example, you know, there is no way of really forging a wa over the course of, you know, eight billion episodes like Pokemon has. Um, but you do tend to see this come out in other ways. So, for example, they have a, a, a very strong group, and the series is willing to challenge wa and to have people come into the group and leave the group and change those relationships around, much more so than, say, an American sitcom, right? American sitcoms do not challenge any of those roles. They're the same thing every single episode. But anime tends to challenge that a lot. Um, I think a canonical example of that is Naruto. One of the reasons I think Naruto is so massively successful is because the wa in this constantly, constantly changes. And we're constantly seeing how these characters are interrelating with each other and how one person leaves the group, somebody is introduced, and what that does to all the dynamics. And um, folks just find that absolutely fascinating, seeing how that is. Again, very different from our way of doing things, which tends to be a very solid core group that just doesn't change episode over episode, season over season, as much as we can. And interestingly, I think a, a counterexample over in the West is the Big Bang Theory. You know, um, I think one of the reasons for its success is the fact that it does challenge WAP slowly over time, but it does introduce new characters, that changes the relationship of the group, there's new dynamics of the WA, and that does shift over time over the course of the series. Um, so, you're going out on your, on your heroic journey, you are exploring, you are um, going out and growing as a person, right? So the question then becomes, um, what are you doing this for? Think about Iron Man for a second. Um, why does Iron Man do the superhero thing, right? Um, it's because he started as a you know, billionaire, philanthropist, all that kind of stuff, a you know, weapons manufacturer. He had all of these things inherent in him, and he then decided to use those to fight crime and fight bad guys and all that kind of stuff. 
the heroes in anime tend to be pulled out of situations where they have no training, no skills, no abilities, and plucked down and told to be a hero. So the main characters in Gundam almost always have no skills or training in piloting a giant robot, but they now have to do that. That is just their responsibility. It's one of the really interesting things about mecha series in general, is they tend to be about um, adolescence learning responsibility through being given a, an overwhelming responsibility and having to just deal with it and growing up as a result of that. It's a very harsh reality in a lot of ways. One of the reasons I think that anime um, can have a lot of, of power for adolescents is because it is often uncompromising in its view of, congratulations, you now have superpowers, deal with it. Figure it out, which is much like, you know, congratulations, you now have three hours of homework a night, deal with it. You know, all of these things that are part of adolescence are very much kind of worked into a lot of these stories. While we're talking about um, a mecha series and such, let's talk a bit about how war is represented in anime, because that tends to be a very common trope in these stories, especially in mythic stories. Um, one interesting thing is how over here in the West, we, ha we do not have a problem with creating war as spectacle. And there is absolutely war in spe as spectacle in Japanese media, but it is much less often. Uh, war is much more often represented as a, a fundamentally destructive force. Um, and what's also interesting um, related into that is that we have this odd trope of the cigar chewing, you know, kill them all, let God sort them out, uh, you know, military official who is just anxious to get into a war. You know, we all live near Washington, D.C., near the Pentagon. We all probably know some military people. I certainly do. I don't know a single one of them that fits this trope because they're like, I'm gonna, you know, those are my friends that are gonna go out and die. I'm gonna go out and I do, I do not, I don't want a war. No, please, as, as, as much as possible. Like, I'll do it if I have to, but nah. Um, and I, I think actually Dr. Strangelove is one of the reasons we have that trope. But this is this common idea. In anime, when you have military individuals, they are all, almost always much more solidly grounded in their beliefs. They don't just want war because they think war is awesome. There's almost always something behind them explaining their motivation for fighting, explaining their motivation for why they're on a particular side of the war. Um, and part of this has to do with the fact that um, you know, Japan has been through a lot of, I mean, Japan's a much older country than ours. They've had a lot of different conflicts over time, and a lot of them are, you know, there's a peasant revolt, there is a samurai revolt, where you can definitely see both sides of the issue. They've, they've had a lot of conflicts that are complicated, and it's, they are much more used to digging into both sides of a conflict and understanding their perspectives on those things. Um, you also notice this, this line is almost always guaranteed to show up in any boy show about war, uh, or something along the lines of this, this, uh, this line, where they will establish that the only reason the hero is going out to fight is because they are defending themselves from an enemy. You know, um, going out and you know, a preemptive strike is never acceptable in a hero. In fact, in Miyazaki's most recent film, The Wind Rises, there's a scene very early on where he kind of blatantly inserts that in the, middle, in the, in the beginning just to kind of to establish his, the, the ethics of his, his movie. That this is about defense, it's not about um, you know, going out and killing people because you want to. Uh, part of this is absolutely fundamentally cultural, having to do with World War II. The fact that anime and manga in general had this very, very big problem following World War II where literally they had just signed a constitution outlawing war forever but they had to tell exciting adventure stories for boys where they're going out and, you know, having adventures. How do you mix those two things together, right? How do you justify an action story um, in that kind of context? And one of the ways they came up with is simply this, is, is always putting it in the context of a main character who is defending himself or herself and his or her family, nation, et cetera, from an outside force. Um, so it's something that, you know, we simply haven't had to address culturally, 
but Japan kind of ha has had to because otherwise, you know, mothers groups would call and complain about your anime series being too violent, right? So it's just one, one of those fundamental things. Um, while we're kind of going off, let's talk about uh, uh, girl hero uh, heroines and, and, and uh, girl characters. Oh boy, isn't it interesting how often female characters in their own shows actually drive the plot? Isn't that nice? Right? Um, they actually solve things. Why is that? Um, especially compared to, you know, our stories where, generally speaking, even in romance fiction, which is generally targeted towards women, uh, it's usually about a girl who is a woman who is going through her, her life and her experiences, and then suddenly a guy shows up. And everything she does from that point on is about the guy and reacting to the guy. Um, this is a claimed by the Highlander novel? Eh, anyway. Um, so, you know, we have this trope. Now, when I've done this panel before, there would every so often, uh, several times, there was somebody in the audience where this slide would come up and they would just do this. <laughs> and I could tell they were huge Twilight fans who were waiting for, for me to trash Twilight. And I was like, oh. Um, to be clear, um, you know, I am not here to say that if you enjoy the Twilight books, you're a bad person. That is not, that's not what I'm saying here. What I am saying is that it is unfortunate that pretty much everything Bella does in the Twilight stories are about the guys and reacting to the guys. The only time she rebels against her boyfriend is to do something that will make her more like him. And again, I don't think this was intentional, I think it just kind of came out, um, but she's not even the heroine of her own story. Really, this is a story about the Cullens, not about them. Um, but over there in the west, over there in the east, we don't have that. Why is that? One reason is in 1966, the first girls' anime was Sally the Witch, which is about a a I think she's about a ten year old girl who lives in a, a magical world. Uh, everyone can use magic. She gets bored with her magic school work, so she decides to travel to the human world and make friends. Uh, whereupon she proceeds to make friends by conjuring up a house and conjuring up furniture and conjuring up a tea set um, by doing this. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, and then her friends have to go back to a department store at night to retrieve a package because that's what you do in Japan if you're 10 years old. Um, and uh, so they do, and of course it's being robbed, and so of course Sally the Witch has to save the day by you know, causing them to fly to the ceiling and ropes to come out and all that kind of stuff. Um, and so at the end, they leave the, the robbers for the cops to pick up the next day. So importantly, episode one of the first girls series ever in Japan is about a girl who has not only agency, she is more powerful than her friends and more powerful than the police, right? So it is a very strong message sent early on and again, I don't think that was, I don't think they were kind of making a firm statement about women's rights in the show, but that kind of became the template of, okay, if you're going to have a show about girls, the girl is going to leave. She is going to get stuff done. I think I have a slide here for, yeah, you know, you think about the shoujo helpmate, the, the, um, the boy who comes in to help out. Um, her tuxedo mask often comes in to help, often saves Serena's butt in the middle of a battle, but... She always starts the battle, and she always finishes the battle, right? He doesn't get in and take her glory. It is her fight, fundamentally. And it is okay that she has a guy come in to assist her, but he never takes over the story, the way he tends to take over in these other media. And again, I think it's just one of those things that has evolved over time. Now that said, there's been a lot of talk over here in America about how awesome the Magical Girls series are, uh, and how wonderful they are for, um, uh, for uh, girls to watch, and how positive, and so forth, and so on. Japanese um, theorists don't have such a rosy picture of shoujo stories. Uh, shoujo series do tend to reinforce a lot of cultural stereotypes around girls and girls' place in society. For example, 
who on earth, within the world of Sailor Moon, knows that Sailor Moon saved the world? No one. Right? In any Magical Girl series, the girl is allowed to save the world as long as it doesn't upset the current power balance. Right? It always has to happen in a pocket universe over here, and everyone else goes along and does their thing. Um, also, they often tend to transform through a magical compact, or a magical mirror, or magical things along those lines that are very traditionally girly, and very much about kind of their, their if you will, role in society. You gotta be pretty. Um, so, there are certainly messages in these series that are not, you know, not necessarily perfectly healthy for every girl in every stage of her life, right? They're, they're, it's complicated. Um, um, yeah, should be noted. Speaking of, one thing that Amory tends to be quite good at is, even in boys' shows, you can have romantic elements. Uh, you know, over here, you're not going to see this in G.I. Joe, right? That's just not going to happen. Um, but we get this in, in boy shows all the time because they have realized, amazingly, that boys do not turn off the television as soon as there's a kiss. And oh my gosh, girls can watch action. Who knew? <laughs> you know? Um, and so there's much more willingness to kind of integrate genre and integrate stories because there's less of a sense that this is a, this is a, this is a kind of element that can only be in boy stories or only be in girl stories. We can weave them together to a, a, to a reasonable amount of mix. All right, um, I want to finish off by talking about some of the different tones in anime. And this is uh, partly cribbed, or very, very much, uh, uh, mostly cribbed, from a book by Susan Napier called uh, Anime from Akira to Princess Mononoke, although I think now it's Hell's Moving Castle. Anyway where she's an academic who identified several different ways that anime tends to structure its stories, which are gonna be different than what we have over here. Um, if you have the apocalyptic anime, right, where everything's going to pieces, it's fascinating how often war stories are apocalyptic, right? We certainly have apocalyptic war stories, but the, the percentage over in Japan is much, much higher, and I think that can be safely laid at the feet of World War II. Then you have the festival, right? The anime series that is basically a celebration of life, of experiencing reality, and of just normal experience. Um, it is remarkable how many anime series are simply enjoying themselves, about enjoying life, just straight up. And then there is the uh, nostalgic, I'll, I'll say. Nostalgic, I said. She used a different word, and I want to make sure I'm going to... Um, yeah, she said El Gayak, which I think is a bit too much of a two-bit word. We'll say nostalgic. Um, and what's also interesting about nostalgic... Um, obviously, you have nostalgia for different periods of time. You also have nostalgia about places. So you'll have... Say, non on Viore is a great example of an anime series. It is nostalgic about rural life and growing up in a small town. Uh, and it's all about making you feel about that. Miyazaki has claimed that he did not mean My Neighbor Totoro to be a, uh, a call to talk about how wonderful it was growing up in the late 50s, early 60s in Japan, and how bucolic that experience was, but that's clearly what it is. <laughs> uh, you know, for better or worse, that is basically what he meant, is that it's something that's very nostalgic for that period. Um, then how does your story end? as you go on, 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 your, on your story. One of the really interesting things about anime is how often the ending is not that great for everyone. And this comes from something that is, um, has been noted as a common trope in Japanese storytelling, the idea of the nobility of failure. This idea of a story in which somebody pursues a goal and not only do they die, not only does their entire faction die, their goal dies completely and utterly forevermore. It is utter and complete failure. A perfect example of this is Ishin Tsungumi. This is a group of samurai uh, working around the time of the, well, in the, in the times leading up to Japan opening up to the West, who were basically pulled together to stop the popular revolution that was going to open Japan up to the West. Um, and some of the folks they were fighting against were arguably terrorists, effectively. 
and they came together to, to keep Japan from falling apart and to uphold the, the, the word of law. And as far as they were concerned, they were doing absolutely the right thing. They were very noble men, and they utterly failed at this. Not only did Japan open up, open up to the West, their leader was publicly executed for failing to essentially stop history. You know, the group was disbanded. Many, many of the people actually died as, as the story went on, or uh, as history went on. And then the group was just completely collapsed. They were, they were essentially asked to fight a civil war, you know, as a group of a couple dozen samurai. It just was not going to happen. The Shinsengumi show up over and over and over in anime because of how fascinating that is to people. This idea of pursuing a noble goal. They were police officers, essentially, special police officers, and then utterly failing at that through essentially no fault of your own, even though you're doing your, your, your trial. And this happens, again, over and over in anime series. What do the, the people in Cowboy Bebop actually accomplish? <laughs> right. Mm -hmm. This is about the nobility of failure. These characters are all, in a sense, losers. And at the end, nothing's changed. Maybe Edward. Maybe Edward. Maybe good, Edward good point. Fine. Good point. Yes. Maybe. I was so happy when, what is it, episode 24, when Ed leaves. And I was like, oh, thank you. I don't want Ed around for however this is going to end. Like, this is not going to end well. I, Ed can be away. Um, anyway, Bebop is a great example of this, where you're following these interesting characters. And you're following them on this story of, of their experience, but they don't save the world. They don't get near saving the world. Right? None of their problems are anywhere near on that scale. And yet it's one of the most popular anime series in America. Actually, not that popular in Japan. Then there's things that are all these things all at once. Grave of the Fireflies is, in its own way, definitely very apocalyptic. It's about a group of, of a, a teenage boy and his sister in 1945 in Japan. Um, so they are living in a very apocalyptic state. It is in many ways also a festival. It is a celebration of their life and their experiences and how they're trying to make the best of it. And it is also, in its own strange way, nostalgic because they're trying to remind us of what it was like back then and keep that in our minds so we don't forget the toll of that experience on innocent people. This is one of the reasons I watch anime, for things like this, that just do everything all at once. If you want to dig more into this, some recommended reading, Macademia is an academic journal devoted to anime and manga studies, published and written in English. So lots and lots of academic um, uh, articles about Topics like this, some of them are, frankly, in my opinion, kind of wacky. Um, it is the classic academic problem where some people are just kind of going off on their own, you know, on their own tangent. It kind of doesn't make sense to me, but some of them are absolutely fascinating. Robot Ghost and Wire Dreams is a collection of essays, the book about Japanese science fiction specifically, but also anime and manga. So if you want to know more about why Japanese science fiction grew as it is, why, for example, there is a mystery in almost every anime series ever, it seems. Um, it is in there. Paul Gravitz, Manga 60 Years of Japanese Comics, did a great job of kind of having an overview of all these, these elements. And then there's Susan Napier's book. Susan Napier's book is, was published maybe 20, 25 years ago. Um, she's since kind of updated it. But some of her theorizing is, was, let's just say, based on very minimal evidence about Japanese culture. So there's some things in there that I do not agree with because I think she was just she only had X anime available to her and she was kind of making assumptions based on those. Um, so you know, grain of salt, but helpful to read. It's kind of the golden bow for uh, manga and anime. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. All right. Um, that is that. I have uh, some time for questions. Thank you all very much. Yes. Okay. Uh, as I so. Uh, he's much more into anime than I am. Uh, the whole idea of the, the mechas, the, mm. the, the Gundams, the things like that, where did that come from? Is that, is that coming out of World War II where, you know, we need the bigger, better machine to, 
defeat the enemy or? So it arguably, yes, but it, it arguably comes out of early 20th century boy stories mm -hmm. where they had this formula of um, a Western power is attacking Japan through no fault of their own. And there is a boy who, needs to, who, who wants to defeat them. And he has a crazy uncle, grandfather, etc., who has invented a flying submarine with a giant cannon on it. Mm. And he uses those to fight off the world powers. And as that went, um, as that evolved, they started adding legs and arms and things to those machines. Now, none of them actually became a giant robot as far as I'm concerned, but it was kind of the seed planted. Then, um, after World War II, you got um, not just uh, various stories, well, especially after World War II, you got Tezuka's stories, which were very much about robots and robots um, of all scales and sizes helping to rebuild after the war. But then also, and then I think this was in the 50s when, um, I'm forgetting the author's name, uh, he did a very influential manga called uh, Tejujin 28, Gigantor over here, where Gigantor was a military machine built to defeat the Allies. It was just completed right at the end of World War II. So it was mothballed and brought back out later, off to, later on to the fight crime. And that kind of became the pattern of uh, that this, that, um, or it, it became you know, the initial inspiration, that th this is a war machine and we are now finding a peaceful use for it. Um, as time went on, uh, especially as the mecha became piloted, it, it's, its meaning and, and intention shifted. It became more about the pilot now having um, extremely powerful resources in, in figuring out his responsibilities in using that. So it became less about, you know, this is a World War II thing and more about what do we do with stuff. And, this, and I would argue that is also part of Japan's um, uh, ever-growing self-defense force, uh, if you will, where uh, Japan is, I believe, the seventh largest military spender in the world, and they don't have an army. They just have a self-defense force, right? And so a lot of those series were about this idea that, okay, we now have all these tanks and jets and all these sorts of things. What do we do with them? What is the most responsible way to do that so that we, we, we don't become the aggressor again, right? So that's kind of where that, um, you know, what I think a lot of those things were dealt with. Great question. Anyone else? Questions, thoughts, ideas? Yes. The wind also rises was, uh, which we saw, I think within about the last year or so, mm -hmm. was very interesting in that technically a movie about building war machines and war, and I would definitely say very, very elegiac, or whatever better word that you had in parentheses, and also mm -hmm. really, really tragedy of failure. You could see that this, I, I took the, uh, the engineer to be someone who is uh, high function uh, Asperger's or high function mm -hmm. autistic Asperger's by our current terminology, mm -hmm. because he was an engineering genius, but he seemed to have no ability to recognize any of the potential morality of what he was doing. Mm -hmm. And if, if anything, the movie came off uh, as, as a warning for a techie like me <laughs> to not lose mm -hmm. that other human side when I'm doing things. We, we, we talked about it with uh, someone who uh, uh, is a wasp, one of the ladies auxiliary from World War II, mm -hmm. and she found the whole idea just completely offensive that she could not separate out uh, these ideas. She could not set, she could not get her mind into the idea that the tragedy of the movie was that he was on the wrong side and he didn't know it and he just plowed firmly and more firmly ahead in being part of the wrong side. Exactly. Um, I'm just trying to uh, see each other here. Um, but it's a, it was a brilliant movie on, on, on that front. Oh, it was yeah. just so different than anything that would be Western. Totally. Um, indeed, The Wind Rises, uh, The Wind Also Rises. Um, so one thing to note, by the way, if you watch The Wind Also Rises, it is not historically accurate. Um, you know, uh, uh, Hiro, uh, uh, his wife outlived him. You know, it's he had a completely different story than that. It's, it's basically melding Hiro's life with a, a famous short story in, in Japan. Um, but the... The historiography of the, you know, the, the development of the, of the zero and all that kind of stuff is quite accurate. So it's kind of a, a weird thing where, yes, it is 
historical, but not history. Kind of complicated. But yeah, that's that's absolutely true. Um, there, I, the main character of original Gundam, I would argue, is high functioning autistic. The main character of the second Gundam series is definitely autistic, uh, on the autism spectrum. It's it's actually kind of interesting how often those things come up. Um, what's also interesting for me is that, in my opinion, uh, the moon also rises. A hero is basically Hayao Miyazaki. Um, because it, it is following the pattern of his life and, and what people said about him and his work ethic and so forth and how that impacted his family, right? Um, so it's interesting seeing that from that perspective of, of Miyazaki. Any other uh, questions? All right, thank you all very much. Enjoy the rest of your talk.